Hi, I'm Noah Gervais. In this video, we're going to be looking back at all three of the Fear games and their many expansions and DLC. We're going to look at what they did right and everything they did wrong, which is a lot. But what they did right is pretty cool, so let's get into it. Time hasn't been as kind to Fear as I think it should have been. When it was released, this awkwardly titled shooter was actually a groundbreaking technical achievement. As a piece of software, it's an enduring triumph. As a game, it's a damn good one. It's got some of the most visceral and exciting combat ever made for the PC, even a decade after release. Of course, Fear's iconic characteristic is that it's also a horror game, and the first of the series is remarkable for how well it balances horror elements within a game that is, at its heart, a straightforward combat shooter. Most of the time you spend with the game is using guns to shoot other men with guns, but that 15% of the time that the game is deliberately trying to scare you is enough to keep a player seriously off balance and wary the rest of the time. Like any good piece of horror media, fear ratchets up the tension slowly and relentlessly. It does it in a way that outwits its extremely silly setup. You're a part of the First Encounter Assault Recon Team. Fear, get it? Which is like kind of a military police version of the X-Files. You play a guy named the Point Man, a newcomer to the squad. In the tradition of many shooters of the time, you have a silent protagonist, which works alright, it doesn't feel as meaningful as it is in Half-Life, but the plot is integrated within the game in a kind of minimal way. And having no real defining characteristics, besides being exceptionally good at combat, goes hand in hand with the game's stark and brutal tone. The setup continues like this. A cannibal psychopath in command of an army of psychically linked vat-grown clone soldiers has broken the bonds of his masters, the Armacam Corporation, and is systematically hunting down those responsible for something called Project Origin, with a heavily armed psychic clone army. Didn't you say this game was clever a minute ago, you ask? Well, I did, and let me tell you why. The clone army actually gives a great reason to be fighting through wave after wave of coordinated assaults from identical helmeted figures. This is a game from 2005. You're gonna get helmeted indistinct guys either way, but here at least the game starts by acknowledging that and making an attempt to incorporate it into the story. More importantly, though, the clone soldiers actually seem to function like a coherent, coordinated group using a wide array of tactics like multiple flanking maneuvers, blind firing in ways that make environmental sense, and chattering to one another over the radio. This credible behavior was given even more depth by beautifully fluid animations and genuinely novel AI design. Fear's artificial intelligence is actually so groundbreaking that there's a 16-page MIT Media Lab article by Jeff Orkin, which he also presented at the 2006 Game Developers Conference, solely devoted to the game's unique advancements in AI. I've linked to it in the video description. While I don't have the technical background to fully relay how innovative Fear's AI was at the time, and how influential it would remain, it essentially boils down to two intensely clever focal points, chaining animations and giving the AI the ability to make dynamic plans to meet goals. That seems basic, but in actuality, using math to mimic human behavior, in this case with a process utilizing academic algorithms called strips, is incredibly complicated. Fear was unusual in that it had one single employee totally dedicated to the AI, and the one-man process bore interesting fruit, necessitating a great deal of autonomy in the AI to make the workload manageable. To do this, they made goals separate from actions. The only things that the AI actually controlled was making a plan to move through an environment to a goal, like eliminating a threat, and playing animations, like running or ducking or firing, as it encountered objects on the way. Ballistics and audio like footsteps are handled by different systems. All the AI does is move and play animations. Previously, people would program AIs to do specific routines with specific patterns, like if you encounter cover, duck, then move around. An explicit kind of instruction as a subroutine separate from attacking the player. The way Fear does it is to share information and actions between goals, which makes each time the AI encounters an object unique and lets the AI make a plan to perform a special action, like ducking behind cover, or not, depending on the stimulus, like if the player is aiming towards you. These plans are made before the frame is rendered, so there's never any hesitation in the animation. This is what gives Fear's enemies such a remarkably lifelike aggression. They really do plan, and they really do react, before you can see them do it. This was a big, big deal in 2005. A recent update to the article on Fear on AIGameDev.com points out that the lessons that Fear has to teach about artificial intelligence are frequently incorporated into modern AI, but in 2005, nobody had really seen a computer opponent in a first-person shooter quite so ruthless and cunning and fluid as the ones in Fear. Jeff Orkin sums it up wonderfully in the conclusion of his paper. Quote, 
Real-time planning empowers AI characters with the ability to reason. Think of the difference between predefining state transitions and planning in real-time as analogous to the difference between pre-rendered and real-time rendered graphics. If we render in real-time, we can simulate the effects of lighting and perspective and bring the gaming experience that much closer to reality. The same can be said of planning. By planning in real-time, we can simulate the affect of various factors on reasoning and adapt behavior to correspond. Horror, of course, is all about simulating the affect of danger without actually posing any. The deadly purposefulness of the AI creates an environment where you are constantly on the edge of death. While this is no survival horror game, you are very fragile compared to other shooters. The game would be almost impossible, in fact, if it didn't give you the gorgeous and infinitely useful ability to slow down time in firefights. While bullet time is most famously associated with the Max Payne trilogy, here the challenge posed by the dynamic AI is so great that bullet time transitions from gimmick to absolute necessity. Having this edge gives the player the confidence they need to move forward, even in the face of being continually overwhelmed by cunning and deadly opponents. It's an atmosphere of oppression, it's an atmosphere they exponentially multiply with the level design and aesthetics. In contrast to shooters that are oriented around cinematic set-piece battles with events triggered by advancement, Fear's level designers tried to reach a harmony with how the AI functions, giving the player arenas that would allow the AI an opportunity to react uniquely to tactical challenges presented by both the architecture and the player. More recently, Alien Isolation was arranged like this, mimicking realistic architecture in appearance while providing a playground for the game's dynamic systems in function. Fear's levels are unbelievably visually sparse as a kind of side consequence. To make it so that the artificial intelligence encountered no puzzling situations, everything was removed that might puzzle it. What you get is a winding series of moodily lit industrial corridors and office spaces using colored lighting, fog, and darkness to obscure, highlight, and give a player direction. It's in the tradition of early PC shooters, a deliberately vast, uncaring labyrinth with no clear way through. Some players might no longer be impressed by fear for these reasons. Three hours of being stuck in some of gaming's most violent sub-basements with almost no plot advancement and no decoration certainly comes across as bland to many. The excitement comes from the shifting balance from hunter to hunted and back again as you fight through the otherwise boring corridors. The final trick up the AI's sleeve is just smoke and mirrors, but it's a critical trick, using radio chatter to make the AI seem more coordinated. Half-Life pioneered the trick, and while Half-Life's AI for its soldiers is not as complex as fears, they also come across as working as a coordinated group, simply because they tell a player that they're doing so. Kill off most of the squad in fear, you hear a fur furious, staticky, we need reinforcements, or if it's down to the last man, he took out the whole squad, with some yelling and cursing thrown in for good measure when the player surprises them or pulls off a particularly deadly attack. Each enemy acts independently, but the dialogue is triggered dynamically by the ebb and flow of firefight as it progresses. It's so simple, but combined with how lifelike the movement of the AI is, it absolutely seals the deal on the thrill and challenge of the shooting. The shooting's uncommonly beautiful to look at, too, on account of a huge range of particle effects, smoke effects, and semi-destructible environments that contort and spark and explode in pretty majestic ways every time you fire your gun. Every time. The slow motion options just make these effects more impressive. Everything is more or less perfectly integrated as far as bullet impacts and bullet time are concerned. So, sure, Fear is 85% a straightforward shooter and 15% a horror game, but the systems in place in the game, the systems of environmental damage, the systems of AI response, the systems that make each eruption of violence compellingly unique, stand on their own. Fear would be a tense game even if it had no horror elements. It would not be quite so memorable, though. Most of the horror elements in Fear are incredibly derivative of Japanese horror tropes, or maybe more accurately, the Hollywood remakes of Japanese horror tropes like The Ring, The Grudge, and Darkwater, an aesthetic that was really popular during Fear's development. It's not the novelty of these elements that make them work in Fear, it's that these particular kinds of horror elements might work even better in games than they do in movies. So, the focus of the plot is on Alma, a little girl with tremendous psychic ability who the Armacam Corporation sealed in a strange containment sphere to study. At 14, they got her pregnant with evil science, and then took her child. And then they did it again. And then she died in sphere, having known 17 years of torture and pain at the hands of Armacam is all there is to life. Anyway, her body died in sphere, but her desire for vengeance persists, and her influence has escaped the containment sphere. Which brings us to the clone army. Fettel, the psychic commander, is one of her children. She helps him break free so that he can cause the violence in the physical world that she's trying to cause in the spirit world. Besides the fact that this is kind of a bizarre mad science riff on I spit on your grave and sexploitation revenge media in general, it's not a wholly bad setup. It's a better execution. 
Because of the difficulty of the AI, a player has to be constantly vigilant, especially on higher difficulties. Getting ambushed is an instant death sentence. So a player is always waiting for a confrontation. So, into the mix, at relatively unpredictable moments, you get a confrontation that's dark, surreal, and supernatural against a little girl ghost to whom flesh is wrapping paper and your soul is the gift. You can't fight it. And confrontation is very rare. Often you'll find Alma to simply be around, shadowing you in the background. One of the game's great strengths is that Alma appears in many of the game's dead ends and hidden places. Sure, you've just found a hidden boost to your health, but turn around and suddenly the lights flicker and it occurs to you that more health is not really the be-all, end-all of the situation. Alma might be unoriginal, but she dovetails so perfectly with the combat. All these military clones and the true danger is a little girl with a supernatural fury. As the game progresses, you get glimpses of the teenage Alma, the corpse Alma. And as the story is revealed, she becomes sympathetic. She's a force of evil and of indiscriminate death, but she's a monster that reflects the monstrous way in which she was treated. Later titles would focus more on the sexual aspects of Alma's abuse, but Fear the First tells a pretty simple tale of evil begetting evil beyond its control or understanding. Alma isn't scary for what she is, she eventually becomes sympathetic for that. She's scary because a player has no idea when she'll pop up next, or in what context. That's Fear's final stroke of brilliance, subversion of expectations in the level design itself. As I've said, all of the level architecture is extremely minimal. Offices, industrial spaces, all empty and blood-soaked and barren. So you're going through these spaces, and just when you get comfortable with all the concrete, you open a door to find yourself outside of normal reality, in something like a memory or a confession or a threat from Elma's ghostly imagination. Like the jump scares, the sudden shifts away from realistic architecture and the genuinely surreal quality of what you then experience makes for a great mix. Horror, like comedy, also benefits hugely from subverting expectations. It even takes the Japanese ghost girl cliché to some bold new heights. In movies like The Grudge and The Ring, a key characteristic of the horror is that it is unsoluble. Absolutely everyone who watches The Ring will die, no exceptions. Everyone who enters the house in The Grudge will die, no exceptions. The curses have an on-life of their own and they will be satisfied. So by the end of the game, it seems that you've killed Fettel and shut down Alma's containment sphere for good, and now you just have to escape. Right? Well, no. As you escape, you're pursued by angry spirits who now seem to be able to cross freely into the physical world. It's very spooky. Your fight from the ghost is extensive and undermines the feeling of triumph and climax. When you do get back to street level, it's bright and quiet. Too quiet. An apocalyptic explosion destroys the city as a consequence of your shutting down the sphere. But you're rescued by the last of the fear team. Everything's gonna be okay after all! You've won! Of course, it wouldn't really be in the vein of Eastern horror if that was the ending. Fear is a horror shooter because it's so much more about disempowerment and tension than it is about empowerment and success. In a game like that, the player can't truly win. In a story like this, Alma would never truly be defeated by any conventional means. So, Alma wins instead. Alma always wins. That was one of the great things about Fear, a real knockout ending. Monolith produced the original Fear, but the ending was such an excellent cliffhanger and the game was such a commercial success that an expansion was quickly developed by Timegate Studios at the request of publisher Vivendi. It's a great expansion. It's got a great moment to begin on, too. Extraction Point continues the Point Man's journey right after the helicopter crash where Alma makes her semi-surprising appearance at the end of the main campaign. So what you begin with is a city that's been half destroyed by a blast and then destroyed the rest of the way by Alma's unbound supernatural hatred. It's the natural next step. It doubles down on the bleak, oppressive tone while introducing new supernatural enemies and allowing for a much more urban, sprawling level design aesthetic than in the main campaign. It's not post-apocalyptic, it's ghost-apocalyptic, and that is a hell of a hook. Unfortunately, the execution isn't nearly as tight as in the Monolith's base game. While the AI supposedly received improvements, the difficulty was tweaked in weird ways, and players will probably want to select the difficulty above the one they played in the main game to have the same rhythm of experience. And it's based in the same subversion of player expectations as the first as well, which is a good thing. In terms of plot, it's very simple. Flee through the crumbling city to the extraction point on the hospital roof. There's some crazy nonsense about Fettel returning as a spirit. They even have Fettel literally say to the player, I know it doesn't make any sense. But they just do that so you can fight the replicas again. So what's subversive about any of this? The fact that you fail at everything you try to accomplish, that every perceived win turns to ash in your fingers. That's the persistent mood of the expansion. Easily the best moment of its type is when Holiday, a survivor from the main campaign, gets torn apart by faceless spirits. 
First, the game has him accompany you for a lengthy segment through several blocks of construction yards and warehouses. The warehouses are a really bland part of the game. Fear always struggles with a kind of generic industrial look on account of its minimalist approach, but Timegate noticeably struggles more than Monolith to make these areas as compelling. What Timegate does, just as well or better, is these surprise moments of surreal horror. These spirits are foreshadowed and glimpsed in passing for over an hour of play before they tear Holiday to shreds. And to have the other, sh the other shoe drop in such a spectacular eruption of crazy occult violence is just fantastic. Overall, Extraction Point is an interesting expansion because it hits higher highs in terms of horror and lower lows in terms of level design than the main campaign. The new replica troops and mechs they introduce seem incredibly powerful and menacing, which underscores them as being monstrous even if they're not supernatural. The feeling comes through in the parking garage level where they introduce the heavy mech particularly. This massive, angry heap of metal and fire is just as monstrous as any supernatural demon, but it's a demon of Armacam's own creation, like Alma. To balance her otherworldly evil, Armacam and the replicas represent a kind of corporate evil, an all-consuming destructive force born, not, born out of human greed instead of demonic malice. Wandering the city, with no one left but corpses and soldiers and shadows, feels incredibly oppressive and merciless, which is exactly what fear is about as a game. Increasing the rate at which Alma appears and the player experiences hallucinations dovetails with the ghost apocalyptic vibe and helps the pacing a great deal as well. The original campaign did have one major flaw, and that's pacing. I'd say almost a third of the game is spent in an office high-rise, and fully half of it is spent in concrete hallways. What plot there is makes little sense and is distributed unevenly. And that's okay, because the characters are as paper-thin as the plot, and the game doesn't really care about them. The game is all about atmosphere and player experience, and it is compellingly immersive without the story elements. In the original campaign, the murkiness and underwhelming presentation of the plot could tend to frustrate, and it sometimes feels like you're not making progress towards anything tangible. So Extraction Point offers a clear goal with an unclear path, blocking you with gameplay obstacles instead of plot ones. It's playing to its own strengths, and I like the expansion for that. And it just keeps on getting bleaker and bleaker. Things really ramp up once you finish a lengthy subway sequence and exit near the hospital. There's the aforementioned parking garage, and then you finally catch up with Jin Sun Kwan, who is dead in a pool of her own blood, her camera flashing in the background, a reflection of the scene where she's photographing the corpses in an army cam lobby back in the first game. Then things get really creepy. The Fear franchise ends up making a person real tired of haunted hospitals, but Extraction Point's hospital is the best in the series. It's short, the ghosts are genuinely spooky, and it gets crazy at the end. After fighting your way to the basement, you suddenly find yourself lost in Alma's visions instead of the hospital itself. It's the lengthiest ghost maze in the franchise, and it's a real aesthetic triumph. At the end of it, the little girl version of Alma and the teenage corpse version unite in a big blue light. The visions disappear, the elevator to the roof comes back on. And at the top of the roof, you have one last, delightfully difficult fight against the best that the replica forces have to throw at you. And still, with bullet time on your side, you triumph. And then you reach the helicopter, and it... explodes. No escape. No relief. You are alone in the dead city forever. The camera pans out across the skyline as fires rage and fettle mouths off about retaliation, not just on Armacam, but on the world. As the game's rubbed in over and over, there's nothing, nothing that a player can do about it. I think, in many ways, this is the note that Fear should have ended on. It's the natural conclusion of the kind of unbound force of vengeance that they made Alma and Fettel out to be. They literally killed the entire living cast. It's a tidy end, and since Extraction Point is so uncommonly bleak for a game, it's a memorable end. But Monolith still had plans for a proper sequel, which would be published by Warner Brothers Games. Vivendi and Timegate, weirdly, decided that they would release one final expansion pack for the first Fear before the reins went back to the original developer. A lot of people felt like the next expansion, Perseus Mandate, was a tired cash grab. I agree with that wholeheartedly. So why is Perseus Mandate so widely regarded as a flop? It's an overwhelmingly boring, mediocre game, sure, but it uses all of the same elements and graphical resources as the original game and Extraction Point, even the same kind of surreal supernatural detours. It even has new enemies and new weapons. Isn't that enough to make a good fear title? More of the same if it was working well before. Plus, it even bridges the time span of the main game and the expansion. In theory, there is nothing fundamentally wrong with Perseus Mandate. In execution, it seems to underline all the deficiencies that have been with fear from the beginning without the saving grace of tension and carefully built atmosphere. Perseus' mandate begins about a third of the way through the first game when Armacam security kill a hostage that the point man rescues. So they send a surprise, never-before-discussed second fear team led by another time-slowing super soldier. 
take their word for it, you're a different character. So even though the player already knows the big plot twist, the upcoming blast that will destroy and consume the city, you still have to slog through wave after wave of soldiers, security guards, and light mechs, and a progression of sewers, and light industrial office parks, and then an office building before something interesting happens. They're incredibly boring environments, made even more boring because they're so cheap. The environments look just terrible in Perseus' mandate, even compared to the original game and Extraction Point. Especially in the main game, the clever AI and the ways the level designers incorporated the AI's patterns into the levels was a powerful draw that kept interest up through the bland moments. Here, the artificial intelligence seems flattened, less lifelike. I suspect to make the elite versions of enemies seem smart by comparison, but I don't know. There is very little I can find about the production history of the expansion. But the one-two punch of environments more brown and bland and boring than ever and an AI that does not even offer a compensatory challenge is too much to salvage the experience of Percy's Mandate. It's not a fun game to play. It's not a compelling game to play. I still played it, and the lessons that it teaches say a lot about what would later happen to the franchise. Its primary problem, the problem that would cause the most harm to the series, is a focus on retelling the same story, Alma's origin story, over and over again with the assumption that the player is still interested. Fear is a good horror game thanks to technical systems in the gameplay contributing to the mood of the aesthetic design. It's not a good horror game solely because of, hey, scary ghost girls. It's a good shooter because the AI is making a very serious effort to try and kill you. It's not solely because masked men with assault rifles are inherently awesome and cool. It's easy to see how this mistake was made, though. If you're not really a gamer, if you're an advertising guy, you look at Fear's popularity and think, oh, it's all these visual branding elements that people love, and then go on to talk about Alma and slow-mo and oh-so-awesome shooting stuff game. If you play a lot of shooters, you know what's really unique about Fear is the amazing rhythm of play and ferocity of opposition. Extraction Point was a great expansion because it picked up right where Fear left off in a hopeless situation that gets more hopeless. Perseus' Mandate has more than an hour or two of outrageously bland shooting before it gets to the point. And here, where it does get to the point, it picks up. There's a long section through an underground uh, old town following the blast that actually sets up its scares pretty good, and in general, the hallucinatory segments of Perseus' Mandate are all well done. The problem is that Perseus' Mandate telegraphs them in advance way too much. Rarely do they feel like a genuine surprise, or perhaps the tension just never reaches a point where a surprise is strongly felt. For example, there are floor ghosts now, and while that's kind of a good idea, they're only dangerous if you're not paying attention. Sometimes they put one down in a hallway where you can't avoid it, so you just equip the shotgun, pop the ghost in the face, and move on. Plus, the entire plot of Perseus' Mandate is a bundle of dumb clichés they don't even bother to subvert through failure. Mercenaries are after almost DNA, and you have to beat them to it, so you do. There's even a traditional boss fight in a warehouse, about as boring a location and as boring a boss as you get. You know he's evil because he takes twice as long to kill and has bigger goggles than the other enemies. And then you get extracted by helicopter. Successfully. There's the ghost of your former partner, who fades away slowly as your CO tells you that the guy would have been proud of you. How heartwarming! I really wish Percy's Mandate had had more than a couple ounces of creativity, because the original game is such a great platform and such a great formula for horror but you have to understand the formula as being broader than insert ghosts and gore into tab A, guns and gore into slot B. Fear 2 is helmed by the original developers, but with a new publisher, Warner Brothers Games. I don't know where the developer's original vision for the game ends and where the movie studio aesthetic begins, but Fear 2 is a completely different kind of game than the first, with completely different values, despite trying to use all of the same elements of visual iconography and branding. I don't really know how to better describe Fear 2 than to say it really is a Warner Brothers production. It's a cinematics shooter and not a systems-based one. It's got a bright color palette as opposed to the deliberately oppressive drabness of the first. It's got a heavy, deliberate pace of combat instead of a fast and frenetic one. It has more scare moments than ever before and fewer actual scares. Now, Fear 2 is still a very fun game and a real winner in the level design department, but it has fundamentally no idea what was special about the first game and goes on to make mistakes that take it further and further from the success of the original. The distinction that most people draw between Fear 1 and 2 is that the first is a PC shooter and the second is a console shooter. I agree, but what, what's that really mean? Well, it means the gameplay is balanced for slower aiming with a controller and balanced for difficulty to appeal to a wider range of players. They weren't wrong, Fear 2 had very strong sales, but it sacrifices pretty much all of the elements that the original game uses to build tension, and the new things that Fear 2 tries to replace it with works inconsistently at building tension. 
The most obvious problem is how bright the game is, how friendly the interface, how each enemy is color-coded by type and features neon colors on the goggles and helmets so you know exactly where to line up a headshot, and how they are literally highlighted in a luminescent glow when you activate slow motion. The rhythm of combat is much heavier and more deliberate this time around, too, with cover you can flip over and big, colorful weapons that do serious damage. There's not a lot of running around. If you can outsmart the first game, the second isn't really even interested in competing in terms of challenge. They kept many of the same elements, radio chatter, fluid and varied animations, use of flanking tactics, but they also broke the enemies down into specific types. Shotgunners, snipers, machine gunners. Each has a specific set of behaviors that's notably more limited than the first game's AI. There, enemies were all more or less the same, but they were dynamic enough to be completely unpredictable. Here, there's a lot of variety, but a huge markup on predictability. Predictability kills a horror game, but it does all right by the action genre. Ultimately, Fear 2 broke down to that. Its values are of an action movie and not a horror game. It's the difference between supernatural horror and supernatural spectacle. Fear 2 is terrible at building tension for a variety of reasons, and being too damn bright and colorful is a good place to start. The heart of it, though, is that Fear 2 wants to be cool way more than it wants to be scary. Way more. And since it wants to be a cinematic shooter, it also includes way more plot and dialogue than any of the previous titles. It leverages the plot into set-piece horror, like a haunted house. In the first game, scares come from moving through a disquietingly empty but otherwise normal environment with a constant threat you understand and an intermittent overpowering threat that you don't understand, with no idea when one will bleed into the other. The second game moves you from room to room to see what carefully placed spooky thing they put there for you. For a game as long as Fear 2, not long by game standards, but really long by Haunted House standards, the player's reaction changes from ah to cool to eh in pretty short order without any kind of dynamic element to keep the tension high. There's a couple exceptions to this in the game, the biggest of which being the elementary school level. Even people who hate the game frequently point out how good a level this is. It's the only level to hit the balance and rhythm of the original game, using a relentless assault from conventional enemies to force you through an environment containing deeper dangers and deeper mysteries. In some ways, it does even better than the original. The environments are comparatively gorgeous, and certain effects, like the rippling of school lockers and the flickering strobe-like movement of angry spirits alongside a more dynamic use of smoke and shadow, turn out just creepy as hell. There's a fight with a twisted monstrosity who you catch playing a piano, weirdly, madly. You hear the foreign music coming down the halls long before you reach him. It's well foreshadowed. And then the slow revelation that the students were being experimented on by Armacan without their consent. Meanwhile, you have heated firefights in school libraries and cheerful foyers, a juxtaposition that works so well with the violence. It's a well-thought-out, well-paced level. It uses all of Fear's branding elements in a way that supports the atmosphere and the gameplay. It's an idea that works, like the idea of a ghost apocalypse. Fear 2 begins with the explosion that ends the first game, but ignores the events of both expansions. Extraction Point and Perseus Mandate are considered non-canonical. What is canonical is the explosion is bad news. Not only is the city destroyed, but the ghosts have killed what seems like everyone who might be left. Here's where the cinematic approach that Fear 2 takes really shines. Games are particularly strong at doing post-apocalyptic, but the addition of all these horror elements and the freshness of the devastation really make Fear 2 feel novel during the urban sections. They're well-designed urban battlefields, sometimes too short, returning you to underground corridors way sooner than you want them to, but very engaging for the time that you're there. Set design is something kind of unique in games. In theater, for movies, it just has to hold up to the angle that you're showing it from. Level, de level designers in games have to come up with environments that are compelling from every angle. Not everybody hits that goal, but it's a common goal. For all its other inconsistencies, Fear 2 really does have a fantastic sense of presentation and flow in the level design. It's a big enough strength that it could have carried the game farther than it did if it wasn't for how compar comparatively overblown the plot is. Fear 2 figures most of its audience hasn't played the first game, and so retells the plot through massive information dumps and after shooting things for a long enough time. It's got logs and collectibles and intel lying around everywhere, eager to explain the gigantic heap of nonsense that is the Fear 2 plot. You see, you're a Delta Force, but you get deliberately captured and experimented on by Armacam, who are trying to replicate their success with the Point Man. The experiments are very evil and weird and involve neon green goop, the hallmark of serious science. The green goop gives you fantastic slow-motion powers, but also attracts Alma like a beacon. The hospital you find yourself in is actually an underground facility, isolated from the chaos above for days or maybe weeks after the blast, until Alma comes a-calling. Oh, and a corporate cleanup crew. Destroying an entire American city is apparently some kind of corporate liability, so Armacam Security is here to shut it all down. 
Meanwhile, a scientist who goes by the handle Snake Fist is trying to blow the lid off the whole thing. Meanwhile, you have to work off Snake Fist's information and use the Psychic Amplifier to go after Alma in her own shadowy world. This is kind of dumb, you say, and guess it is. And if it had been relegated to the background of the game, had been left vague, it would have worked out okay. But you can't have a cinematic, plot and character driven game without making a big to do about plot and character. Fear 2's primary plot and character focuses on Alma, of course, but they use the character pretty differently. Because it's a sequel, there's really not much build-up. Alma's a deadly force of ghostly destruction from about 20 minutes in through the end of the game. And to accommodate all the series' newcomers, we learn her story all over again. The presentation, though, is flawed in the same way the rest of the game. It wants so hard for Alma's big moments to be cool that they never really manage to make them scary. And I mean, Alma's appearances are certainly cool, make no mistake, but she's part of the haunted house, a chainsaw with no chain, all the noise of the engine and no real bite. I still like these sequences, they add a lot of personality to the game, even where they add no tension, contributing to the two-star action movie feel, using the franchise's iconography to generally good effect. And that's the failure of the game as a sequel to the first. It's fun and thrilling and bright and eager, where it should be difficult and moody and dark and callous towards the player. I almost feel like it would have been better as some other game, not part of the Fear franchise, but the strongest parts of the game are the ones that resonate with the rhythms and scares of the first, and the novel setting of the ghost apocalypse. And then there's the final level. The final level is doing its own thing entirely, and I don't quite know what to make of it. I don't think anybody can definitively say why they chose to do it this way. It begins straightforwardly. You reach the amplifier and are sent into the nightmare world from which Alma draws strength. It's wonderful and surreal. You fight shades of one of your former squad mates driven mad by jealousy. Yeah, jealousy. Alma doesn't want him. She wants you. For making a baby. And you're not saying no. You see, while your mind is having a wicked cool boss fight, your body is getting raped by an underage teenage ghost. I'm not interpreting this situation, this is explicit and canonical, it's what happens to the player. The amplifier was just a trap. Now, the surprise bad ending, it worked in the first game, it's a good idea. Ghost rape? Ghost rape is a pretty bad idea. The main thing that's weird about it, outside of what's obviously weird about it, is how Alma is alternately a little girl in a red dress or a naked corpse, and how the game deliberately makes her naked corpse character model a little more sensual and a little less monstrous, and then switches the horror from a girl seeking revenge on a world that abused her to, essentially, having Alma be this amazing supernatural pregnancy machine. Having psychic children was an injustice forced on Alma. It's one of the reasons for her revenge. It's not a superpower of some sort. Alma is evil, and in Fear 2, her womanhood is part of what's supposed to make her evil. It's dumb, it's weird, and it seems like an incredibly twisted take on the common trope of rewarding the male protagonist with a girl at the end of the game. At the end of Extraction Point, Alma's revenge was infinite, and that was fantastic. In Fear 2, Alma needs Player 1's baby-making bits to realize her revenge. Literally. It's like they pulled three people about what's scary about Alma, and one person says because she's relentless, and the second person says because she's unpredictable, and then the third person says, I don't know, man, probably like ghost pussy? And then the producer points to respond at number three and says, this guy, this guy gets it. There's a DLC for Fear 2, weirdly enough, and the DLC is actually a distillation of everything they did do right with Fear 2. Reborn is a bridge between the plots of Fear 2 and Fear 3, for all the good that does. The DLC itself, though, is something kind of special, and it really surprised me with its quality. In it, you play a numbered replica soldier, descending to cause further havoc on the city's skyline. It's a weak start, an overpowered mech segment across a rooftop construction zone. So much of fear is construction zones and hospitals, it's frustrating. But once that's over, a neighboring skyscraper topples over, and you race across the destruction to activate some kind of transmitter. So far, so generic. The transmitter, however, gives Fettel's unbound spirit away into your mind, and he grants you Fear's iconic slow-motion ability in exchange for your unyielding devotion and the death of your squadmates. Then it's a protracted and spectacular fight to the epicenter of the explosion, back to where Fettel is still trapped. Reborn takes the time to showcase pretty much every enemy type and variety of encounter in the game in rapid succession and lovingly crafted detail. The aesthetics of the level design are top-notch as well. Overall, the DLC, the DLC feels like a labor of love by a design team that's had time to reflect on the strengths of their creation. It's priced terribly at $10 for DLC for a game from 2009, but I suspect they figured only a completionist would play this, and a completionist can easily be separated from $10. 
I think that's kept a lot of people away from this DLC, and why I never hear it talked about. That's a shame, though. This is a sharp package. Trying to navigate an overturned skyscraper, crumpled and slumped against another, is fantastically disorienting. I've never really seen anything quite like it, and I play a lot of first-person games. And the ghostly devastation has never looked better, particularly as you approach the epicenter. The scale of the supernatural apocalypse Alma Rot becomes excitingly clear. The short length of the campaign, the intensity of the firefights, the wild, freewheeling variety of encounters, it's all a lot of fun, and fun is ultimately what Fear 2 was best at. Even the things that could have been played off as scary are played off as moodily cool here in Reborn. Another part of Reborn's peculiar charisma is that it gets its subversive feel back. Fear 2 used objectives and information conveyed through the HUD without comment or really even necessity. Here, your objectives are in the form of bizarre psychic imperatives from Fettel. It's delightful to have the fact that players blindly follow objective instructions highlighted in this way. I mean, sure, Fettel coming back is kinda dumb, but they did it an extraction point, and I'm used to the idea. There's not a lot of supernatural stuff, either, but what there is, is really well done. Eventually, you reach a church where the origin facility once stood. It's a hallucination, sure, but it's a damn cool one. You're tested by phantom soldiers, and then, proving yourself worthy, you give yourself over to Fettel, who takes off your helmet and reveals something kind of important that many Fear fans may have missed. The clones all have Fettel's face. He controls a psychic army of himself. And then Fettel possesses the poor stray clone. So, now you've got all the story components that Fear 3 would use. Alma's pregnancy, the destruction of the city, which Fear 3 would call Fairport, and Fettel's release into the world at large. So then they got legendary action horror director John Carpenter and screenwriter Steve Niles of 30 Days of Night fame to come in on the project. The only people they didn't get was Monolith. Fear 3 would be developed by Day One Studios, who worked on the console port of the original game. Fear 2 had already moved the series from horror to supernatural action. How much damage could the newcomer possibly do to the franchise? I'm going to start off talking about Fear 3 by talking about what others have said about it, beginning with John Carpenter. In a 2005 interview about the original Fear, which he was a spokesperson for, he said, I always approach a game mainly because of my background as a director in terms of its graphic look. How does it look? Does it look real? Does it feel real to play? And I thought when I played Fear and watched Fear, this game has taken a giant step forward in terms of gaming. This is awesome. The freedom of movement, the character movement, the character development on screen, the graphics, it's just a whole lot of fun. Then, in a 2010 interview about Fear 3, he reiterated, It's all about gameplay. That's the secret. Going on to say about shooters in particular, Tell me who I am, what to shoot, how much ammo I have, and where to get health. Okay, so John Carpenter sees fun gameplay as a game's defining characteristic. Jason Frederick, Fear 3's associate producer, characterized the game like this in a 2011 interview. Quote, We definitely wanted to make sure we nailed all the tenants that make the Fear games stand out from the pack. The series has been known to seamlessly blend great storytelling, frenetic combat, and horror. And Fear 3 is no different. When we began writing the story, it wasn't long before we decided to focus on this incredibly compelling family consisting of Point Man, Fettel, and Alba. Adding co-op made perfect sense for us and breathes new life into the series." End quote. Okay, so it's all about the gameplay and co-op, and it thinks the Point Man is compelling. So how'd it turn out? Colin Moriarty, writing for IGN in 2011, said, quote, A horror and gore-inspired romp, Fear 3 approaches the conventions of first-person shooters from a different perspective and successfully mixes together familiar gameplay elements with a unique and authentically chilling setting. Fear 3 isn't without its problems, and these problems stop it from being a top echelon shooter. Still, its tendency to go off the beaten path is largely successful and will appeal to shooter fans and horror aficionados alike. From the single-player campaign that can be played through twice with two different characters, to the co-op campaign that you can play through with a friend locally or online, to an incredibly thoughtful multiplayer offering, Fear 3 has a lot going for it. End quote. Reviews in general skew above average to good. John Carpenter is very proud of it personally. I can't help but ask, are we talking about the same game? The game I played, and Steam insists it is indeed Fear 3, is possibly the most self-defeating game I've ever seen. It is a game that conceptualizes literally everything about itself in terms of branding and consumer appeal. It is a complete and total mess. How could this happen? Well, Fear 3 is what happens when you design a game that decides it needs a unique marketable concept, co-op in Fear 3's case, and then makes the entire game bend and contort to serve the concept. There's a whole heaping helping of stupid on top of it, but it's co-op, the thing that they clearly thought was the most important thing about Fear 3 that is the most destructive to what the game is supposed to be, both in terms of being a horror game and in terms of being an action game. It's terrible on both counts. 
But let's break down its failures as an action game first, since all of the fear games are more about action than they are about horror. The most obvious, avoidable failure is that, as an action game, it is derivative of every shooter cliché imaginable, stealing here and there from almost every popular shooter of the time, except, critically, the earlier fear titles. It has regenerating health, it has systems of points, perks, and rewards that stays persistent across multiplayer and multiple playthroughs. In fact, completing the game nets you only rough, roughly half of the available experience levels. You're supposed to play this game in co-op. Yes, they say you can do it single player, and you can do it single player, but the experience is literally no different from co-op. You're playing the exact same campaign without player two. As you play, each player is supposed to compete for who gets the most points. You get points for everything. Picking up items, picking your nose, slaying enemies, anything. Playing Fear 3 is a constant stream of colorful pop-ups telling you how great you are at this game. The first game was so successful at creating tension and a bleak atmosphere, even if Fear 3 was good at creating atmosphere, and it categorically isn't. All this positive feedback from the point systems would kill it. In a way, getting these bonuses becomes more important than anything going on in the game. They're the basis of the competitive co-op, and they change the ending if you do play co-op. Since the plot makes no sense, and the levels are aggressively boring and terrible, you're pretty much reduced to thinking, I might as well try for ten more grenade kills for these made-up useless points, and spend the next t twenty minutes thinking about grenade opportunity and ignoring everything else. Or you could simply not care, and the game will cheerfully give you bonus after bonus after bonus anyway. Maybe that would be okay if the gameplay had the rhythm and challenge of previous titles, whether the ferocious AI of the first or the wide variety of enemy classes in the second, but Fear 3 takes a different approach. To accommodate two players moving through an area together in co-op without getting separated, the game continually closes off areas you've already passed through to prevent backtracking. This means that every combat encounter is an arena combat encounter with a wide open space and dozens and dozens of enemies. Of course, they have less variety than the second game, and they're all dumber than a bag of hammers, but they're deadly. So what you get if you play single player are massive arenas with cheaply overpowered enemies who don't use tactics, but do rush and overwhelm the player if you can't smash them quickly enough. It's seriously cheap and very reductive, especially in regards to melee enemies like the laughable hellhounds and the cultists. They just hop over walls, rush at you, and you kill them until Fettel tells you not to anymore via in-game dialogue. It's a no-effort approach. It's what you get when you make assumptions about how shooters are, quote, supposed to be, and reduce fear ba to its back-of-the-box selling points. When Jason Frederick said, quote, We definitely wanted to make sure we nailed all the tenets that make fear games stand out from the pack, what he seemed to have meant was including things from previous games on a checklist. Slow-mo? Yep. Alma? Check. More blood on the walls than paint on the walls? Check. Guns and stuff? Double check. Well, all right, there's all the tenants that make fear stand out from the pack right there. Game finished. Throw in some weird-looking enemies, and then we're done. I don't think anything underlines how massively Day One Studios missed the point of the game than the second level of eight levels. Eight big ol' 45-minute levels. You see, nine months pass between Fear 2 and Fear 3. Can you guess why? And the point man's been captured by Armacam and is being held at a secret facility in South America. The facility is an abandoned asylum. It's not actually very creepy, but the game assumes asylum plus blood equals creepy, so there you go. That's the first level. Then when you escape, you have to spend close to an hour fighting through the slums of Rio de Janeiro to reach a helicopter and fly back to Fairport. Does that sound familiar? It should, because the entire level is a ripoff, and I mean a direct ripoff, of the Favela level from Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, presented without comment. It's a cheap knockoff, too. It looks terrible and is a tedious chore to play through. And it's over 10% of the entire game. Literally, the only reason I can think of for its inclusion is some kind of bizarre assumption that if Call of Duty did it, all shooters that want to make money should do it, no matter how inappropriate to the setting. That's Fear 3 in a nutshell. It cares more about its image as a product than its coherency as a game, by a huge margin. There are a lot of weird assumptions at work in Fear 3 about how a shooter is supposed to be, the weirdest of which is that despite the fact that this is a cinematic, cutscene-driven, dialogue-heavy shooter, they still make the point man a silent protagonist. In cutscenes. He has a beard this time, which perhaps counts as character development, but to make up for point man's silence, they have Fettel monologue incessantly and in a deliberately annoying way. Fettel has always been a weird cannibal psychopath, but he was a quiet and soft-spoken cannibal psychopath in the first game. He was mysterious. It kind of worked. Here, he not only never shuts up, but constantly talks to the point man, talks to player one in the most condescending tone possible. 
I'm not completely sure, but I think Fettel in Fear 3 might be the single most dislikable character I've ever seen in a game. Not because of who he is, or what he does, but because literally every line of dialogue sounds like a teenager trying to think of what a super edgy ghost genius might say, and then a voice actor hamming the lines up so much I wouldn't be surprised if a corkscrew tail spontaneously erupted from his backside during recording. It's awful. I cannot complain enough about the way they chose to write and present Fettel, and all of it because of the goddamn co-op. Two brothers, one good, one evil, who will triumph. Won't that look great in the press release? John Carpenter said that writing for a silent protagonist was a challenge, and he was happy with how it turned out. But why did he even bother retaining that detail? Literally everything but the branding is different from previous titles. This is the detail they decide is too important to change? Fuck that. The silent protagonist was used in the first game because the pacing is seamless and the plot is relayed in real time. There are no cutscenes. It is not a cinematic shooter. Fear 2 was a cinematic shooter, but they still had more than one character, and conversations happened around your character and included your character, even if the Beckett didn't contribute anything. And the plot was still advanced in real time, instead of with cutscenes. Fear 3 pretty much just has Fettel. Fettel in the cutscenes, and Fettel doing running commentary throughout each and every level with the entire point of Fettel's character being that he's an insufferable jackass. So you've got all the same characters as earlier games, and a continuation of the plot with zero understanding of how to use those elements. Least of all, Alma. Alma's changed a lot, screenwriter Steve Niles said. She's a lot more aggressive. She's a mother. She's got more to protect and defend this time. In that very same interview, John Carpenter had this to say after being asked about the game's weirder sexual themes, like the fact that the whole plot revolves around trying to stop Alma's ghost pregnancy. He said, The only sex I've ever seen in a game is in God of War 3, with a scene where you have sex off-screen and punch the button. Man, I punch the button. Okay, so clearly Carpenter wasn't really going to try to handle the game's sexual themes delicately, but it would have been probably okay if Niles had been talking about Fear 3 with any accuracy because Alma is not aggressive in the least. In fact, she has no agency and no effect on the story whatsoever. Fear 3 is all about Fettel leading the point man through seven themed levels, a haunted Costco, the suburbs, an airport, a big bridge. I mean, a spooky big bridge. And then Fettel and the point man reaching Beckett, your character from Fear 2. Even though Beckett was a silent protagonist too, the game has no problem scripting lines for him to yell about the horror of ghost rape and demand that you abort the ghost baby ASAP. Now, as weird of a thing as it was in Fear 2, as poor of a choice it was to make Alma's sexuality part of what's monstrous about her, Fear 2 doesn't even begin to compare to Fear 3 in terms of how exploitatively schlocky they play the character. Either this scene, or the end of the game. It's hard to pick what turned out worse, but let's talk about how Alma is used throughout the whole campaign, as a brand icon. There are Alma jump scares scattered throughout the level, supposedly randomly triggered, but I never felt like that was the case, because she never poses any threat. She's purely decorative. And it's almost always spooky little girl Alma, because teenage corpse Alma is very busy being pregnant. Nine months pregnant! During which time Fairport has been taken over by Armacam, and everything with the plot just kinda chilled on hold. They make it very obvious that Fairport is supposed to be a knockoff version of Seattle, so one thinks that the US government might take an interest, but since Armacam is openly killing everyone in Rio de Janeiro in Mission 2, who can say? Who gives a shit? The game has more holes than plot anyway, and it sure talks a lot, so you'd hope that wasn't the case. Anyway, Alma's biggest contribution to the game is big shockwaves from her supernatural contractions. I'm serious, she knocks helicopters out of the sky and shatters every window in the city with her lady bits. There's not even really any revenge or sense of her even having a motivation. She's just undead and knocked up, and that is her entire character arc. You'd think that wouldn't be the case, because they spend almost an hour of cutscenes in the whole final level making sure the player understands that Fettel and the Point Man are sympathetic characters, even though one never speaks and the other is a narcissistic psych psychopath cannibal. The whole last level, which makes no sense, you just sort of end up in an Armacamp facility after the airport level with a lot of dialogue in between and no actual explanation. Within the facility, you fight the Creep, a monstrous projection of the hatred Alma has for Harlan Wade. Fiddle says it's not Alma's fault they're a family of monsters, it's Wade's. So you go around, shattering memories of Wade to weaken him, and then when he's good and sad because he was so mean to everybody, you have an uninspired boss fight that could either be Dead Space or Mass Effect 2. I'm honestly not really sure which they were trying to rip off more. You see, Fettel and Point Man were innocents. They didn't want to become monsters. So then when the boss fight is over, it's up to them to decide what to do with Alma and her baby. 
There's two options. Either Fettel gets his way, and he eats Alma's body alive to consume her spirit and grow strong, and then he raises the baby as his acolyte. The other option is that Point Man can kill Fettel, somehow, and then save the baby while Alma dies from whatever weird undead childbirth complications there are associated with that sort of thing. Then he gets to leave a hero and probably go shack up with Jin Sun Kwan, the only other female character in the game, because he's manly and she's really into supernatural killers that never speak. And if you think that's the tackiest thing you ever heard in your fucking life, get a load of how they determine which ending. Point totals from co-op play. As the brothers struggled to the death, your totals from each of the four categories of point bonuses flash on the screen. The better performer is labeled the favored son and gets to decide if their mother gets eaten or just tossed aside. So, yeah. The character who drowned the entire world in her sorrow and anger back in Extraction Point is just a baby dispensing device to award either player one or player two in Fear 3. The good guy gets the girl, the bad guy gets the power. People talk a lot about sexism in games, and there's a lot of people that say as a counter-argument, I have never seen misogyny in a game. How dare you make such an accusation? Well, here you go, buddy. I didn't expect to find misogyny in Fear 3, but the ending of this game is explicitly sexist on so many stupid, pointless levels, and this is on top of a game whose actual gameplay is tedious, whose level design is asinine, and whose dialogue makes Yu Bol look like an artistic genius. I would rather watch Alone in the Dark starring Christian Slater than play this game again. That's how terrible it is. It is awful, derivative, and insulting at every turn. I don't need to call this game sexist to say it's terrible, but its sexism is just one more layer of terrible bullshit on top of the mountain of shit that is Fear 3. It didn't kill the franchise, though. The free-to-play multiplayer release did. Did you even know there was a fourth Fear title? It's Fear Online, a Korean-developed free-to-play multiplayer title that I cannot even find reviews for. I have never heard it discussed. No one seems to care about it. Since Reborn, the DLC for Fear 2, was such a pleasant surprise, I thought, you know, maybe Fear Online is a real joy. Well, there's only one positive review on the first page of Steam Reviews. It reads, Uninstall works. It's all the review I think anyone needs of the game. It's the game's only positive aspect. Everything else is a tangle of disconnected bullshit so bizarre that it not only fails as a game, it fails as software. It has several tutorials, none of them illuminating. None of the game modes are explained. It says you can do some things in single player, but you can't. You literally can't. Everything that resembles a linear plot mission, and there are only three such missions, are only available as cooperative multiplayer, and are only playable, like really playable, with a four-person party. Its AI is the dumbest yet. It just spawns and spawns and spawns, and the enemies march forward towards you, and sometimes, when you don't kill them fast enough, they overwhelm you and you die. It's all about numbers. Of course, you have to play hours of this game and win missions to unlock new weapons to make this, this process easier, unless you want to pay cash money for pretend weapons in this terrible game, which some people, from what I saw, do. I categorically do not understand the free-to-play mindset. It drives me crazy to have games that are designed from the inside out to be too annoying to play unless you pony up some cash. And then people whip out their wallets anyway and say, well, okay, pal, but only if it lets me win every time. Fear Online is probably the most janky, broken shooter I've played in ages. It uses the same game engine and the same graphical resources as Fear 2 back in 2009, except it never even looks half as good as Fear 2, even when they're recycling the exact same environments. The dialogue, what dialogue there is, is in broken English and is basically a jumble of franchise keywords. It is explicitly what Fear 3 took some looking at to reveal. The only things that matter to the game about Fear are the branding elements. It doesn't care about the technology Fear pioneered, it doesn't care about the atmosphere Fear mastered, it doesn't care about the graphics Fear pushed. The second game might not have been as good a game as the first, but it was still a competent and enjoyable action title. Fear 3, at least, was a stable piece of software. It looked okay, and it didn't crash. Fear Online is worthless, literally and figuratively. And what would even be left for the franchise to move forward with if they wanted to move forward from Fear Online? Alma, the series icon, is fully dead in both endings of Fear 3. Consumers no longer associate the Fear franchise with quality of any kind. Point Man isn't even a character, and Fettel just... sucks. It's ironic that a recurring theme of the Fear games is that greed will kill, and damned if that isn't exactly what happened to the franchise. It commercialized itself to death. 
It paved the way for other horror titles that take its place with the technologies it pioneered and the presentation techniques it showcased, but increasingly, Fear is a forgotten franchise. And I think that's kind of too bad, because for all the franchise's many, many failings and missteps, there's still something irresistibly charismatic about its balance of elements. But if it doesn't have the balance, it doesn't have the charm. And these last two titles are some charmless shit heaps. Still, though, is it a series worth playing? I'd say yes. The things the first two games do well are done very well, and many of the things about Fear are done uniquely in the games. And I had a ton of fun, for not a lot of money. Which, I say, is pretty damn worth it. Thanks for watching. This video is supported by crowdfunding through Patreon. I'd like to thank some patrons who are currently donating $10 a month or more. They would include Cassie Bayer, Christian Zacharyanson, Zoe Bshik, Pat Hay, Yuri Petniz, White Zero, Espen Steinsnes, Irvin, William Kreusch, Joshua Hartnett, Oliver Handleken, Joe Wolf, Kimo Heikinen, Stephen Person, Richard Stevenson, Jonas Neefs, Hakan Sealealu, Junis Rock, Stephen Lark, Preston Allen, Daniel Zooks, Signe Jensen, Ken Young, Dalton Seiler, Nobody, Jonathan Fleikener, Sil, Sangusta, Ryan Gunst, Brad Wallace, Connor Biblo, Kumarin Villalu, Chocolate Cake, Anax of Rhodes, Niels Bachfrommer, Spire Sideris, Kevin DeBolt, Rob Clark, Matthew Lagden, Harley McElroy, Valentine Selesniov, Jared Liebmiller, Michael Gillis, Brandon, Carl Gleason, Tim Marsh, Richard Williams, Jack Point, and Tizer Vicarian. And thanks to everyone else who currently donates to me on Patreon. Thanks to everybody, I was actually recently able to leave the pizzeria that I worked at for four and a half years. I'm doing this full time now. I hope you enjoy. Thanks for watching again.